welcome to the DMI podcast with me, uh, John Orchard, on Fifth CEO. And today we're talking to Saskia Devolda, uh, who is Strategic Programme Director at SWIFT, uh, the Worldwide Interbank Payments Network. Uh, as such, of course, SWIFT plays a central role in the global financial architecture uh, uh, that has been up for debate uh, time and time again in our CBDC and payments discussions uh, at the Digital Monetary Institute here at OnFIF. Uh, the most radical proponents of blockchain and DLT-like products um, have suggested money and value transmission could be moved away from commercial banks uh, and their existing systems and networks, and although plenty of central banks and regulators dislike that idea for multiple reasons, um, and cross-border cu cross currency transactions uh, are fairly hard to solve for uh, in the new models at the moment. My people working um, hard on that with, uh, with a range of experiments. Um, nevertheless, um, elements of the disruptor's ideas are being incorporated into upgrade plans for what we have now, uh, and we'll explore that uh, a bit today with um, Saskia. Saskia, before we do, tell us a bit more about your rather interesting role at SWIFT. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, indeed, I'm looking at uh, a new program set up to enhance cross-border payments. Uh, the objective is actually to support, indeed, in uh, on the one hand, you know, everything we do in SWIFT related to enhancing cross-border payments, but also the collaboration with the G20 program and making sure that we get all the expertise, which is uh, in different places within SWIFT, whether it's products or strategy or our innovation teams, that I can bring that all together under one umbrella under the program uh, to really be able to help everybody in the industry uh, and to have access to all that expertise. Thank you. Well, looking forward to talking to you about that today. Um, I think it's important each time we have these discussions to, to revisit what we're actually solving for. Uh, in these discussions. So I thought we'd start by asking what the key challenges are um, facing cross-border payments. What, what is it that needs fixing uh, in our view? Yes, I think there has been a lot of debate about that. And actually, um, since we've developed GPI, we can actually track and trace um, transactions. And hence, indeed, we can demonstrate that uh, transactions are um, overall quite fast uh, with a, a medium of less than two hours and depending on the routes so on some routes we have a medium uh, which is below 15 minutes and on some it's even taking up to 22 hours but as you mentioned it allows us to see what are the hurdles really that uh, hamper transactions to happen within five minutes um, and I think the biggest ones are, on the one hand, currency controls and regulatory requirements in certain jurisdictions. And the second one is the processing capabilities as well from market infrastructures as beneficiary banks. And what do we mean uh, with market infrastructures? It's the limitation in opening hours. If we look at the banks, it's indeed the, their capability uh, or the number of hours that they can process on 24 seven should be more and more. Um, but also if they do batch processing or one-by-one uh, -one processing, all these things that the beneficiary bank and the market infrastructure also are some of the hurdles that we see uh, not to come to transactions within five minutes. Okay, thanks. So Saskia, essentially where uh, we think we're solving for speed, albeit that of course is contingent on all sorts of factors, including the uh, destination banks or recipients, uh, which, uh, which might uh, be beyond uh, um, certainly your jurisdiction, but uh, and there's a whole there, there are a whole range of technological upgrades taking place to the systems that connect uh, the banks, of course, which uh, which you're centrally involved in. Um, so talk us through in more detail, perhaps what can be done to address these challenges, uh, but also safely, so that we don't lose uh, the regulatory and security issues that I know bother regulators and central banks. Yeah, correct. And um, well, if we go back to the two reasons, if we go back to the currency controls and the regulatory requirements, of course, SWIFT and the banking community, we are not able to change those, but we can develop products and services uh, like pre-validation in which at least the, bene the, the beneficiary bank can inform the bank that is sending the transaction on what are the requirements in order to fulfill those. Uh, and hence uh, also items like there is a lot of um, mistakes going on into the account uh, information. Uh, all those elements can be pre-validated so that when the transaction is being sent, uh, the speed can be increased. 
um, of course, ISO 20022. A bigger standard, um, what I mean with bigger is it can contain much more data, but also much more structured data, which definitely help, helps with the regulatory requirements. Um, and then, of course, as mentioned in my introduction, the G20 program, um, working together with the uh, public sector, uh, because they can look at those regulatory requirements. We see that they look at the opening hours of market infrastructures, they look at the different data frameworks, they look at SLAs and schemes and much more. So we're actively working with them to align um, as this is very aligned with our overall strategy, which we built it a couple of years ago towards instant frictionless cross-border payments anytime, anywhere. Uh, could we just spend a bit of time on the factors that regulators wish to keep oversight of uh, amidst all this technological innovation, which of course everyone is hoping will speed up payments and reduce uh, their cost, particularly cross-border. But what is it that regulators and supervisors uh, worry about uh, in cross-border transactions? Well, what do they worry about? I think they want to make sure that all transactions are according to the regulations which are locally issued. Um, so they need to keep those, but I think it's up to them and us, the, the financial industry, to work together to keep according to the rules, but to speed up the way we exchange and to give more clarity and like uh, ISO 20022, you know, make sure that all that data is available to everybody in the chain. Um, so that's one of the reasons why together with the industry, we'll be launching uh, this year the transaction manager because it allows everybody in the chain, whether it's a market infrastructure, whether it's a commercial bank, to have at the same time access to that data and perform all the required uh, regulatory uh, activities required so that the transaction is safe, uh, that you know it, it's according to the rules, but it can still speed up the entire transaction. Uh, we know with some of the innovators that they are uh, wrestling with the tension between KYC and AML on the one hand, uh, and privacy and anonymity on the other. The existing infrastructure somewhat deals with that already, doesn't it, through the fact that banks are carefully regulated. Um, talk a little bit about the tension between uh, privacy and, uh, and KYC. Whew, I think that's a difficult one. I think for that, SWIFT is not really in a position to take any stand. I think we, um, you know, we transport um, transactions. We, uh, we, of course, make sure that the banks can fulfill their um, obligations. We help them in some cases with uh, solutions like sanction screening and, and using artificial intelligence to do that better and faster. But the content itself is not up to SWIFT uh, to decide. Understood. Um, how uh, do you think, Saskia, then banks, uh, exchanges, central banks, of course, payment platforms and others um, should work together to deliver instant or frictionless payments or certainly much faster and much uh, less friction laden payments? Yeah, I think it's about collaboration. Yeah. And as mentioned earlier, uh, we really work as we are a cooperative, we work with uh, the industry to see what we can do to make payments faster and more transparent. And as mentioned, the rails were set five years ago when we started GPI. Um, and as we see GPI and we see the hurdles we have uh, developed together with the industry, for example, Swift Go, focusing more on retail and SME giving full transparency both on the cost and the speed before the transaction is executed. Um, as mentioned, the pre-validation, the pre-exchange of information before the transaction is being done. Um, GPI Instant, which is the bridge between domestic instant payment systems so that more in the instant payment space, uh, we can actually interlink them using the same rails as GPI. Um, Looking at the transaction manager, uh, which will orchestrate the transactions, meaning that all the information required for a transaction will be exchanged uh, simultaneously, and then the use of ISO 20022. And then, as I mentioned, it's the collaboration with the public sector as they are looking at opening hours of market infrastructure, which are in the value chain of a cross-border payment. And there's a lot of market infrastructures actually involved in a cross-border payment. So if we can enhance that, the 24-7 capabilities uh, due to new technologies of the commercial banks, um, 
all of that, I think it's, there's not one magic bullet that will make cross-border payments faster and better. I think there are many different elements that need to happen at the same time. And I think as SWIFT has this um, strategy or towards uh, instant and frictionless payments, and we see the intention uh, of this group of the G20 with the FSB and the CPMI, uh, that they focus on that. I think the collaboration between public sector and private sector is the right way to go to solve this. Yeah, and they, uh, the public sector certainly seems to think that as well in all the discussions uh, that, that we have. We think that's important. You mentioned um, ISO uh, 2022. That's, uh, I think, important development. Do you want to briefly explain what that is, Saskia? Sure. You know, in order to uh, people to exchange. And if we take this interview, you know, I don't know if you're in native English, but I'm not native English. If I would speak Dutch as my, uh, uh, my language, we probably have a communication problem. So the first of all is that in cross-border payments, we all need to speak the same language, which is a standard. And we're moving now uh, from 1502, which was a standard we developed uh, years ago, to 2002. And the big benefit of the standard of ISO 2002 is that it contains much more data. And as we were talking earlier about all these uh, regulations on a local level that need to be fulfilled, you can add all that information into the standard and it's much more structured. And due to the fact that it's very clear structured makes that it can increase the STP rate within the banks so that the processing of these transactions can happen faster and with less hurdles. Thank you. That seems like an important development, actually, to help the existing infrastructure evolve and incorporate uh, uh, the, the, the real benefits of the disruptors while retaining all of the important attributes we've talked about on regulation, security and so forth. Um, we talk a lot about uh, central bank digital currencies at OMFIF for obvious reasons. We're a central banking think tank. Um, there are uh, a wide range of views among central banks about when and how uh, CBDC should be introduced. Uh, and then, of course, there are distinctions between wholesale and retail um, as well. Uh, a lot of that isn't resolved. But on the other hand, there are important experiments running, such as the uh, PBOC with the E1. Um, what role do you think, Saskia, uh, CBCs could play in the future of payments? Well, first of all, we see clearly, as you already mentioned, that there are different reasons why uh, central banks are looking at, uh, at the CBDCs and um, indeed the physical money uh, being less used and especially in this pandemic we see that digitalization uh, overall happening. Uh, we understand indeed that uh, they want to expand financial access um, and that's very different in certain parts of the world. Um, also, indeed, we understand the whole crypto uh, currency, uh, which can lead to or at our potential risk, I would say, to substitution of fiat currencies and hence probably weakens the role of central banks in the economy and their ability to manage monetary policy. Um, it also leads, I guess, uh, to some innovation. At least we all work together to look at uh, different innovation and different cases where uh, that innovation uh, could really um, uh, support the industry. Um, now, if we look at the role of SWIFT in that, uh, we are actually quite agnostic. Uh, we, you know, for us, it's a currency and it's the same currency, a euro, a digital euro or a classical euro. We will uh, guarantee or we will work to have interoperability because if CBDC stand on their own, uh, we will create the same problems as we have today with cross-border payments. So we need to think all together from the beginning, what are the elements required to guarantee interoperability and not only interoperability between the different CBDC systems, but also interoperability between the CBDC systems and the fiat currencies used today. Um, and I think that's the role of SWIFT to work together on interoperability. Uh, we are agnostic, so we can transport different types of CBDC models, whether they're using DLT or other uh, uh, technologies. And, you know, we're, we're, we'll orchestrate them, as we mentioned, together with the other um, currencies. And we are looking at the different models to guarantee interoperability uh, between the standards, between the protocols, between the channels. Uh, and on top of that, we are looking at developing adjacent services to guarantee, like we do uh, today, uh, to make payments safe, secure, and complete. 
I think you paint a very good portrait actually of the discussions we hear in central banks between uh, a defensive move to defend the sovereignty of money and a proactive move to attempt to speed up and cheapen payments, uh, especially cross-border payments, um, which often run into quite complicated problems. Cross-border uh, CBDC is, is quite difficult between currencies, uh, although there are some important experiments where uh, that's being shown to work. Of course, SWIFT and the commercial banks, whatever you might um, think of that network, already solve all those issues. Well, I think issues can potentially all be the same. You know, whether we go for CBDCs, uh, depends, of course, exactly how they set them up, whether we look at interlinking, for example. Um, you know, some of the uh, hurdles that we see that we discussed a bit earlier on um, currency controls and regulatory framework, they might not mandatory go away by using a CBDC uh, or you know, the effects, the currency conversion, those things are the same, whether you go for CBDCs, uh, cross-border, whether you go for fiat currencies. So the question is, do we think about these problems in the overall, or, you know, do we try to solve one of these elements only, and then maybe forget about the other? So I can only say, as like I said earlier, I think the collaboration and the exchange of knowledge, the review all together of new technologies, regulatory frameworks, you know, to take everything together and uh, the collaboration, the intelligence in the private and the public sector together can only solve uh, some of these issues altogether. I think that's right. There have been important experiments by, for example, MAS working with commercial banks on uh, cross-border CBC and stable coins, as you know. Um, the ECB is uh, looking at spending five years setting up a working group to look at um, the digital euro. Um, the Fed, from what we hear, is pretty uh, sceptical at the moment about CBDC and would rather leave the private sector to solve these problems. Uh, and then, as we've mentioned, uh, China is, uh, is racing ahead and a number of uh, developing markets have got some very interesting experiments. So it's a very heterogeneous scene at the moment on CBDC. Um, given that, what do you think Saskia the payment space will look like in in five years um, will it have uh, evolved will it have had a revolution um, what what would you expect well john unfortunately i don't have a crystal ball uh i wish i had that would make i think everybody's life much easier um now i don't think it will be a revolution uh the main reason why i don't think it's going to be a revolution is that we can all together not take any risks you know the evolution that we need to go through and which i'm quite sure will be substantial needs to be done in a safe way you know we need to do innovation absolutely but really test innovation before we actually jeopardize the entire financial industry and the trade and the economy that uh, that really requires all cross-border payments. Um, but I'm sure that on the one hand, new technologies will be implemented. So look at APIs, um, DLT, uh, cloud, artificial intelligence. They will enable payments to be exchanged uh, faster and allow some of these hurdles to overcome. Um, also the public sector that seeks collaboration with the private sector. Uh, and they can actually together solve a number of the issues um, as an industry together, being regulators, central banks, commercial banks all together. Um, as SWIFT, we are a global cooperative. Um, and as mentioned, we will be working together, but we also want to guarantee that nobody is left behind. Not all the banks around the world are able to evolve in the same way, to invest in the same way, to um, upgrade or have the same uh, business needs at the same time. So we will make sure that there, uh, we have on the one hand focus on interoperability, but also making sure that all parties involved uh, are coming uh, onto the evolution. And um, we believe that these developments are necessary uh, to have less silos, to have less closed loop systems and guarantee more interoperability on a global scale. And the transaction manager will allow some banks to go faster and some banks which don't move that fast, at least guarantee interoperability also with the ones moving faster and using much more new technologies. Thank you, Sasio. It seems to me that one way or another, certainly payments are heading in direction of being uh, faster and, uh, and, and ultimately we, for the person in the street, probably uh, cheaper cross-border in the end as a result of all these 
um, changes uh, and innovations. So uh, we look forward to talking to Swift about that as you um, play an important role uh, in the in the upgrade of the payment system globally. So thank you very much for talking to us today, uh, Saskia, and looking forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, John. Thank you.